It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom a hundred and twenty satraps, to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault, because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel, unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction, that whoever makes petition to any god or man for thirty days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the pit of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document, so that it cannot be changed, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom a hundred and twenty satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. Now, a satrap is a governor who rules over a satrapy. So think of the United States. It's divided into fifty states, and each state has its own governor. So ancient Persia was divided into different satrapies with each satrapy having its own governor who was called a satrap. Now the issue here is that we know from historical sources that Persia was divided into about 20 satrapies with 20 satraps ruling over each one of those satrapies. So why does the Bible use this huge number, 120 satraps? That's a hundred greater than the actual reality. Well, different people are going to respond to this situation with different explanations. Now, I'm not in agreement with this, but those who believe that Daniel has confused or muddled historical information, uh, they think he is confusing different figures here. They think he is confusing Darius the Mede, who we're discussing here in this story. Darius the Mede with uh, Darius the First, of Persia, who comes along 20 years later after the period that Daniel 6 is trying to deal with here. And if he is confusing them, it may be because Darius the Persian was famous for setting up satrapies in the kingdom, and so he's just confused Darius the Persian with Darius the Mede here. Uh, here's a text from Herodotus, Darius the First, that is Darius the Persian proceeded to establish 20 governments of which the Persians call satrapies, signing to each its governor and fixing the tribute which was to be paid him by several nations. Now, I don't think that Daniel is confusing Darius the Persian with Darius the Mede, because if you watch the last video, you know that Darius the Mede is likely Cyrus the Great. That's the case we made in the last video. If you didn't see that, I recommend you go and see that. But I don't think that there is historical confusion here. So what Daniel is telling us is Cyrus the Great, the first Persian king, divided up his kingdom into 120 satrapies. Okay, uh, but that still doesn't resolve the issue of the number. Why is the number so big? Why is it 120? Well, some say it's just a Jewish hyperbole. It's a way of communicating the greatness of the empire, of the Persian empire, that Persia was so huge and so wonderful. It had 120 satraps. Well, did it historically have 120? Well, no, but this is number is an overstatement meant to just to communicate the greatness of the Persian Empire. And then others will say that, no, it's not a hyperbole. As Colin says, the word satrap was also used for lesser officials by Greek historians. And the Aramaic word for governor was used for governors of areas smaller than satrapies. In other words, what the Persians called a satrapy, uh, 20 big areas in their kingdom is what uh, you know other aramaic speakers or the greeks they could use that same word to describe not necessarily big states but little counties right so so you, you 
you know, again, take the United States. It has 50 states, and each state has many counties. Well, maybe that's what Daniel is talking about here. He's talking about one of these smaller states, one of these smaller counties. And if this is the case, and there is some evidence for this, again, from Aramaic language and from the Greek historians, then what we're talking about here is Cyrus setting up lots of these smaller counties across the empire, and therefore Daniel uh, is not necessarily historically mistaken when he makes this assertion. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. We know from archeology span that the Jews became more zealous about the law of Israel as the exile went on. Uh, there are these documents called the Marashu documents, which were found at a site along the uh, Kabar Canal, the same place where Ezekiel received his revelation of the Lord. And it had a list of Jewish names. And the interesting thing is the fathers had names that pointed to Babylonian gods, suggesting that these Jews had adopted Babylonian customs and religion, uh, or at least their fathers had, and had given them Babylonian names. But out of 20 persons whose names proclaim the graciousness of Yahweh, half had fathers whose given names invoked the favor of the idols of Babylon. In other words, you know, the, their fathers had been given names referencing Babylonian gods, but they themselves had been given names referencing Yahweh, showing that at some point in the Babylonian exile, the exile began to work. People became very serious uh, about their faith and their allegiance to Yahweh. And Daniel here seems to represent this reality. Uh, he is just one piece of a larger picture of how the Jews became more zealous in the exile as time went on. One interpretive pitfall we don't want to fall into here is to think that uh, every act against the Jews, or indeed every act against Christians, necessarily is motivated by religious hatred. Uh, these guys don't like Daniel, not necessarily because he's Jewish, not necessarily because he worships the one God, but because they have vocational jealousy. Daniel has done well in the kingdom. He's been uh, lifted up into the number one position over all the satraps, and these guys don't like this, and they're trying to shoot him down. And so they're going to use his Judaism against him, not necessarily because they're anti-Jewish, uh, but because they're anti-Daniel, and so they're just looking for anything they can use against him, uh, such as his Judaism. I had a guy who used to try to get me fired when I worked for a certain tree company, and he was over me, and he did not like me, and we would take our equipment, and sometimes we would leave it for a few hours in the parking lots of churches whenever we weren't using the equipment, and it would make a mess, and sometimes it would damage these parking lots, especially if they had been uh, freshly uh, paved. And anyway, one of the churches asked us not to leave equipment there anymore because of the damage we were doing. And I thought that was very reasonable. And I decided that I just wasn't going to leave equipment at churches anymore. Well, this boss of mine, he tried to force me to do it. And it wasn't that he hated churches, right? It's just that he hated me. And so he was using his Christ, my Christianity against me and, and trying to play the authority card and say, no, no, if you want to keep your job, uh, then you're going to leave this equipment in that church parking lot the way I just told you to do so. And of course, I refused. And uh, it, it's just interesting to me because this guy was not anti-Christian. He only became anti-Christian because he disliked me and he wanted to use something against me. And I think it's important to recognize that sometimes that happens. Every time you hear anti-Christian rhetoric, it may not be that people are just so intrinsically evil and hateful of Christ uh, that, that that's what they're doing, especially in the political world. It may be that they have other agendas and they have Christian opponents. And so they're just trying to use the Christianity against them, not because they're intrins intrinsically anti-Christian, but because they have other agendas and invoking Christianity is for a utilitarian purpose. Another practical point to be drawn out here 
is that if the church's enemies want to accuse us, it should not be because we are unfaithful in our jobs, responsibilities, or lawful duties. As they say of Daniel, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find a connection with the law of his God. They had to go to the law of his God because he handled his responsibilities diligently. And I think this just speaks to the fact that uh, uh, if you are a Christian, you're a representative of Christ, you should try to do well in everything you do, um, especially on the job, because that's a, a primary place of witness, right? And if you have an enemy who has to try to use your faith against you, well, that might be a good sign, because uh, if he were able to use your other failures and lapses in responsibility against you, he would. Uh, if, so I, I just think it's a good sign. Uh, as far as Daniel's concerned, that they had to try to use his devotion to the Lord uh, because he had not left any other holes in his game. The high officials and the satraps come to the king and they tell him that all the satraps and counselors and governors are agreed that the king should pass a, uh, an ordinance that says no one can petition any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king. And if they do, they should be cast into the pit of lions. Now, the first thing we want to note here is that these men are lying, right? Uh, they say that all the high officials have approved this idea, and this is clearly not the case since Daniel would never approve of this idea. And so we get our first glimpse as to the impoverished character of these men who are manipulating the king. Now, Newsom brings to the forefront here the historical issue. The proposal these men are making, she says, is nonsensical and at home only in folkloric fiction. Preventing the petitioning of any god or person except the king would wreak havoc on the religious and social order of the kingdom. So there are many places in the book of Daniel where there is some difficulty, some issue defending the historical integrity of the text. And in my opinion, uh, this is the hardest one of all the book. Uh, because, I mean, what you think you, you might know about the Persian Empire from movies like 300 is wrong. Uh, you remember in 300 that the king regards himself as a god and he requires that everybody else worship him as a god. Well. Persian kings just didn't do that sort of thing. They were very relaxed and they were very uh, non-dogmatic when it comes to uh, the religions of subjected peoples. They left the Jews in Jerusalem with a lot of freedom uh, to run the temple and to do their thing, etc. Uh, and so it seems very unlikely that a Persian king would really say, hey, you have to worship me as though I am a god. So what can we do here? To, for those of us who have an interest in salvaging the historical integrity of the book of Daniel. Well, it could be that the Persian king was to be regarded for the time as the only representative of the deity or the chief mediator of prayer. In other words, Daniel is not suggesting that these men are saying, hey, you should be the only God for 30 days and no other God should be petitioned. The idea is that if someone wants to petition a god, they have to go through the king, that he is a representative of the deity, or uh, they, they bring their petitions to him, and then he offers up their petitions to the god himself. And this solidifies the authority of the Persian king, makes him a sort of a high priest for 30 days as the sole intermediary between the people and the deity. Now, that would be much more historically plausible. And this is exactly what Walton argues. Uh, John Walton, Old Testament scholar, argues that the decree makes sense if seen in the context of a certain struggle that took place in Persia uh, at the time of the exile between Zoroastrianism and the advocates of the old pagan religion in Babylon. The old pagan religion in Babylon and Persia is what the Magi would have favored. And again, this struggle is attested throughout most of the 5th century BC and the first half of the 4th century BC. And Walton suggests that the decree could be seen as a stand against the old religious system because as each individual directed his prayer daily to the king as mediator, the king in his public ritual would have directed these prayers to a Mazda. He thinks it was intended by the king uh, 
to apply only to the Iranian population, the main population in the center of the empire, and not to all the subject peoples. All right. So in other words, uh, you have all these different gods who are worshipped in all these different ways, uh, but there's this one type of religious practice, Zoroastrianism, which has put the god Ahura Mazda above all the other gods. And the king is complicitous with this. He wants to promote Ahura Mazda. And so in order to promote this type of religious practice, he is saying, hey, you know, you want to petition anybody? It has to be Ahura Mazda and you have to go through me. And this is part of this religious struggle that was taking place at the time. Mary Boise tells us that Ahura Mazda was originally the name of a Persian deity and was later incorporated into the religious system of the prophet Zoroaster. Zoroaster taught that this god, whose name means the Lord of Wisdom, was the one supreme deity. Although he is all-knowing, he is not all-powerful, as his power is challenged by the evil spirit. All right? So you have a system of dualism here. You have the supreme god, Ahura Mazda, he is good, and then you have the supreme evil god, the evil spirit, and they are against one another. And this is a reality that continues until the evil spirit is defeated by Ahura Mazda at the end of time. Ahura Mazda sends various lesser gods to earth, the place where evil can be conquered. Now Zoroaster's teachings include the justice of God, a reward and punishment after death, a resurrection of the body, and a final cataclysmic battle led by a world savior. And so in the era, era of Gnosticism, when Christianity was struggling against Gnosticism, Gnosticism oftentimes had uh, an infusion of Zoroastrianism to it. You can tell that because there are so many um, elements of Zoroastrianism that are similar to Christianity, though there are some very important differences. And so Walton is going to suggest that the king here is promoting this religious system, and he's saying that, you know, if you want to petition the God, you have to do it through me. Uh, I will be sort of a high priest to take your petitions to him. Now, this is more historically plausible, but again, it is very speculative. Uh, and so uh, this is Walton's attempt to salvage the historicity of this aspect of the book of Daniel. Those who do not accept this will simply suggest that the tensions that the Jewish people suffer in this story here in Daniel chapter 6 kind of look like the sort of thing they had to face later under the Greek period. And so this story was written under the, you know, in the Greek period uh, uh, to, to reflect the sort of persecutions they were feeling at the hands of Greeks, but they just put a Persian king on it. They, they wrote the story, uh, it, you know, from, uh, from a Persian put it in a Persian narrative context, even though it actually deals with issues they faced later on under the Greek period. And so anyway, a difficult historical issue and people have approached it in a number of ways. The law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Now, this is a place where Daniel, again, has been criticized. They say, this is ridiculous. If you're a king, you can revoke any law you want. What's the purpose in being king if you can't revoke your own laws. And so the book of Daniel has been criticized for this. However, there is some corroborating evidence both in and outside the Bible. Two times in the book of Esther, we are told that the laws of the Medes and the Persians cannot be revoked. So this is not just some weird thing that Daniel made up uh, on his own. Also outside the Bible, the Greek writer Diodorus uh, records a similar instance under Persian law. He states that Darius III could not repeal a death sentence passed on an innocent man. All right, so it's already been passed. The law is out there. The de declaration has been made concerning this man's fate. And even though Darius knows that the man is innocent, he cannot repeal the law. So there is some evidence there from a Greek writer who is certainly uh, not intentionally corroborating the Bible on any level. Now, it's interesting how this works out in the book of Esther. Uh, an additional law is passed stating the Jews can defend themselves. So he sends out one law stating that there is a designated day for slaughtering the Jewish people. Then he has a change of heart. Well, he can't just rescind the original law. So 
he passes a second law stating, yes, there is a day for the Jews to be slaughtered, but now here's another law stating that the Jews can prepare to defend themselves on that day. And so he just passes a second law to offset the effects of the first law. Now, for the narrative intentions of the book of Daniel, what we need to recognize here is there are two laws in tension. Within the space of just a few verses, we have seen that Daniel is dedicated to the law of his God. And now we get a reference to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. And so this raises the question, what is the greater law here? What is the greater law that cannot be revoked? Is it the law of Yahweh or is it the law of the Medes and the Persians? And what Daniel 6 will do is it will work toward a resolution of this question, what is the greater law? Which one cannot be revoked? And by the end, we are going to see that the answer is the law of Yahweh, not the law of the Medes and the Persians. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petitions and pleas before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within thirty days except to you, O king, should be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed, and he set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, No, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Now beyond a shadow of the doubt, the richest part of this story is this part here, where after Daniel has heard about this law being passed, which is set to the tune of his own destruction, he simply goes to his house, opens the windows in his upper chamber toward Jerusalem, got down, and three times a day prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. There are a multitude of practical and devotional points that can be drawn from this, but I'm only going to bring out a few. First of all, Daniel neither hides nor is confrontational about his faith. Now this is important, right, because a lot of Christians have kind of a martyr's complex where they're con confrontational on purpose in order to provoke resistance against themselves or because they have more fleshly motives. I worked at a soup kitchen where you know I wanted us to hire more Christ-minded people. And we had finally hired one. She talked a big religious game when we put her on about how the Lord is her protector and how she's just there for the sake of the Lord. And after we employed her, she became known as the prayer princess because every time it was it was time to go work, to do some labor, well she just went and prayed with people, right? And if you confronted her about it, she said, well, I think that, you know, it, it would be better for me to pray for people than to do these other things. And she was very confrontational about it. She seemed to think that every time someone wanted her to work, that they were persecuting her for her faith or that they just weren't as spiritual as she was. Uh, and the simple fact of the matter is she was hiding behind her Bible uh, because she did not want to work. And she was going out of her way to be confrontational to try to set things up according to that narrative where she was the poor persecuted Christian. Uh, it's important to note Daniel does not do that. He is not confrontational about his faith. 
As Jerome puts it, Christians are not to expose ourselves rashly to danger, but so far as it lies in our power, we are to avoid the plots of our enemies. Now, set the wise words of Jerome in contrast to a group of early Christians called the Circumcellions. The Circumcellions were from North Africa, and they had a very interesting method of being put to death for their faith. They wanted to die as martyrs. And since martyrdom didn't always come easily, uh, they developed a method. And what they would do is they would take a club, they would go out on the road, and they would wait for someone to pass by, and they'd bonk them on the head, and they'd say, in Jesus' name, and they'd hit them on the head. And their hope was that if they assaulted people in Jesus' name, their victim would turn and kill them. And if they kill me, well, now I'm a martyr for Christ. Right? I'm, I'm a martyr because I hit you on the head in Jesus' name, and, uh, and then you killed me. Uh, so this is very foolish. This is obviously very stupid. I think Jerome gets it right uh, when he says what he says here. We are not to expose ourselves rashly to danger, uh, but you know, if it comes and it's unavoidable, then we accept it correctly. Now, some have set Daniel over in opposition to Christ here on the subject of prayer because Daniel goes up, he opens up his window and prays where he can be seen. But what does Jesus say? Jesus says, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room and close your door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So this is an iconic passage here in the book of Matthew. And this is an iconic passage here in the book of Daniel, but they seem at least on the surface to say opposite things. Now, can they be reconciled? I think uh, Golden Gate says something that's very profound and it gets at the, the very spirit of the issue here when he says, when prayer is fashionable, it is time to pray in secret. But when prayer is under pressure, to pray in secret is to give the appearance of fearing the king more than God. So in Christ's time and place, prayer was a fashionable thing. Jesus complains that the Pharisees and the synagogue leaders are praying on street corners because they want to be seen by men and they want that attention and they want to be greeted in the marketplace and they wanted to be seen as religious leaders. He says they've already received their reward. They can expect no future reward. They should be praying in secret. But Daniel is a very different situation. Daniel is in a context where uh, prayer is not fashionable. People are not going to greet you in the marketplace if they see you praying to Yahweh. Uh, they're more likely, especially in this 30-day period, well, of throwing you in the lion's den. And so he's in a context where it's very different. So it matters the social context. The social context dictates whether you go into the inner room or whether you do something publicly. Uh, I've made a habit of taking my Greek New Testament to my new job and reading it in my break times or lunch times. And I feel a, a little bit self-conscious because I think, man, you can't practice your piety in front of people. However, at this job, uh, people do not care about the things of God, like it seems at all. And I'm always looking for opportunities to witness to them. And it's so hard because they just don't seem that interested in hearing this sort of thing. And I think, you know what, if they see me reading the text, that could potentially lead to a conversation. It certainly isn't gonna make them like me more. Right? And so maybe this is a, a place where I should not do this in secret. Now, you know, if I were at the seminary or, or at church or something, uh, being in a very, you know, reading the Bible very openly where people can see me, that would be hypocrisy. That would be for attention. So you just have to be wise and to pay attention to your context. Link makes a final point here that I think is very applicable. He says that prayer was more revolutionary than outright rebellion would have been. Rebellion simply acknowledges the absoluteness and ultimacy of the emperor's power and attempts to seize it. Prayer denies the ultimacy altogether by acknowledging a higher power. If we resist evil by ousting it with the sword, then all we've done is envied the type of power that evil has and taken it to ourselves. And now we're going to be evil. This is why the Sermon on the Mount, and these other places in the Bible, such as this place here in Daniel 6, are so much more powerful than power. If you pick up the sword and use power to get rid of evil, you're just going to be evil yourself before it's said and done. Uh, but prayer is different. Right? Prayer says, uh, 
not only is there a power greater than the power of the sword, uh, it's a way of saying that I don't want your power for myself. Qualitatively speaking, I'm interested in a type of prayer that is that is categorically different than what the world systems have to offer. Uh, prayer is stronger than the sword because it does not put me in a position where I have to pick up a sword like you. Because if I pick up a sword like you, then I'm just as evil as you are. Right? So, so prayer gives us this sort of qualitative distinction uh, from tyrants who use the power of the sword to harm good people. Now, certain politically conservative Christians have drawn analogies between this passage and public prayer. There was a time when teachers would lead their students in a prayer to God in Jesus name, and now it's illegal to do so. And many Christians are bothered by this because they say if, if prayer was public in Israel, it should be in America. Well, Longman responds to this, and Longman is the most conservative scholar out of all the Daniel scholars that I read before putting this presentation together. And he says, first of all, the modern equivalent of ancient Israel is not America. The modern equivalent of ancient Israel is the church, right? Israel was the covenant community then. The church is the covenant community now, not the United States. And so he says, quote, Christians should be working to keep prayer out of public schools, manger scenes off the front yard of city hall, and we should be working to keep the Ten Commandments out of local magistrates' offices. When the church has state backing, it grows complacent, or even worse, coercive in its witness. Indeed, study has shown that when the church gets an entry into the power structures of the state, whether the government per se or public educational institutions, it has hurt, not helped, the cause of the kingdom. Now, you would expect here for him to to point out the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. That's usually the go-to point for, hey, you want to see how evil Christianity can be when it abandons its scripturally prescribed state of weakness and takes on power and the sword? People usually go to the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, but he points to a more recent period. He says, I believe we can see this in a country like Korea, where the church exercises enormous influence on the public sector and also has significant wealth and power. And the power struggles within Korean ecclesiastical stru structures are notorious, right? So if you go to South Korea, you're going to find that the conflicts between different types of churches and different types of Christians in that country are obnoxious and nauseating. Now, why is this? Because in their form of government, the church has incredible power. And once the church has that kind of power, it, it's corrupted by it. Uh, and so we should be careful not to hijack passages like these in order to uh, use them as a pretext for the church getting more power publicly or in a state sanctioned sort of way, because that always hurts the reputation of the kingdom with the greater culture. Now we have this issue of Daniel praying three times a day and facing Jerusalem. This would become normative Jewish practice. If you know any sort of Jew who's zealous in his faith, you know he does this. At 9, 12, and 3 o'clock, he faces Jerusalem and prays. And indeed, we know that early Christians, uh, many of them did this as well. Now, you have this passage here in 1 Kings that will explain why Jews and why Daniel, it seems, is facing Jerusalem. Solomon says, when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, and when they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people, Israel. Solomon says this, but also uh, you have this in the Psalms. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in fear of you. All right, so uh, look, you know, uh, this is a good Jewish practice. It is biblical. Early Christians did it. I used to have one of those compasses that you can get online, which always point to Jerusalem, so you know which way to face to pray. Uh, at the same time, I think it's rigid legalism to say you can only pray this way. 
you have a few places in the Bible that discuss this kind of prayer, uh, but there's no indication in most of the prayer passages that you have to do this. All right, so so I, I would just say that first of all. Now, what about this practice of praying three times a day at nine, twelve, and three? Um, is that biblical? Is that necessary? Psalm 55 says, evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan and he hears my voice. Now that looks a lot like the Jewish practice of nine, 12 and three o'clock prayer, right? And so a lot of people who are defending Judaism are gonna point to this passage and it does indeed work for them. However, it would be a mistake to say that there's some sort of mandatory or prescribed prayer times of 9, 12, and 3 in the biblical period because, again, Psalm 55 is just one voice. We have other versions. Psalm 119, seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. Well, uh, what happened to three times a day? Well, there's diversity here. It's, there's not just one way to do things. First Chronicles mentions only morning and evening prayers in the case of Levites who worked in the temple. So. Uh, if this is so important, how come the priests don't have to do it three times a day? It is not until the Mishnah, that is uh, around uh, 200 AD, that we have definite evidence in Judaism of prayer being prescribed morning, afternoon, and evening. So if you're around Christians who are into the Hebrew Roots movement, and they're just, they, they want to be Jews or something like that, they'll say, you know, you're supposed to pray 9, 12, and 3, do like Daniel did. Well, People didn't read that this way until after the time of Christ, and we have a diversity of options within the biblical text itself. So as important and iconic as this practice has been for Judaism and for certain Christians who wish that they were Jews, uh, making it sort of a mandatory rule and placing it upon people uh, is unnecessary. And these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Making petition is the same vocabulary as was forbidden in verse 7. Now this is significant because some suggest that Daniel wasn't actually breaking the rule, that they only saw him as making petition. They saw what they wanted to see. All he was actually doing was praying and giving thanks. Uh, so <laughs> the, basically, According to this view, Daniel did not violate the rules of the state. The state simply said, don't make a petition to any other god. Well, if he just goes and he gives praise and thanks, well, he didn't ask for anything. He didn't make petition. Uh, so these guys saw him as breaking this law, though he didn't actually do so. Uh, this reading, believe it or not, actually exists in the commentaries. And it just seems strange to me because verse 7 seems to plainly say he was making petition. He was breaking this law. Now, Bill Arnold points out a wordplay here that I thought was interesting. Daniel's enemies are seeking to find a fault in him, but instead they find him seeking God. The irony here is that his enemies think they have found Daniel's weakness, but the narrator knows they have actually found his greatest strength. These wordplays and ironies are built in here uh, to make these points. This is not a weakness, though the world may see prayer as weakness, uh, in, in, for different reasons today than they did then, but this is actually a person's greatest strength, this tendency to pray. So they bring it to the king, and when the king hears what they have to say, he's distressed, he sets his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions, and the king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no diversions were brought to him, In sleep fled from him. The word used here in Hebrew for the king not eating indicates the normal deprivation of food as distinct from religious fasting. In other words, don't get the wrong idea. The king did not go and fast unto the Lord for the sake of Daniel's salvation. That's not this type of fasting. His is like a nervous fasting, like he's a nervous wreck and therefore he can't eat. Uh, don't get the wrong sense of the king here that he's this righteous and religious dude uh, fasting unto the Lord. He's just fasting because he's nervous and he can't eat. Now it says no diversions were brought to him. A uh, little bit of a difficulty here in Hebrew uh, because the meaning of the Hebrew word is actually unknown. And we're just trying to guess at it. its meaning essentially based on the context. Suggestions include special food, 
musicians, dancing girls, concubines, etc. Those things that the king does when he's trying to uh, enjoy himself, that's what the word seems to refer to, and it could be any one of these things. But this is just one of many places in the Hebrew Bible where we're not actually sure what a word means. A point to be drawn here that I think is important is the incompetence of political power even when it means well. As Pace says, although King Darius is shown to like Daniel and to shudder at the thought of harming him, it is crucial to remember that Darius never challenges Daniel's accusers concerning their pretexts, even though he has several opportunities to do so. Furthermore, the king fails to challenge the law that a decree cannot be changed, nor does he offer any law to supersede it. This incompetence of the king is contrasted with the dominance of his officials. Uh, which cannot be underestimated in this case. I think Pace gets it exactly right that, you know, sometimes political power means well, but that doesn't mean everything is going to turn out well. And the church has to be careful about working so hard to get a political endorsement from a certain political party because there's very limited things that they can do for us. The church has always done more for political parties than political parties have ever done for the church. Now, two of the words used to describe the king's wishes, namely that he desired to save and to rescue Daniel, are words normally associated with the activity of God. Right? So these words are used to describe the action of God who saved the three youths from the fiery furnace back in chapter 3, and are used throughout Daniel 6 to indicate God's response to Daniel. In other words, uh, you look to political power to save and to deliver, to rescue, uh, but ultimately man cannot do these things. He cannot do these things in any sense, any sort of a final and resolute way. Uh, Yahweh alone is the one who saves. Law, Yahweh alone is the one who rescues, not the king. Then at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they and their children and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. During forever, his kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Now, some suggest that this is an ordeal instead of an execution per se. So what is the difference between an ordeal and an execution? An execution would have no time limit. If the person was still alive in the morning, you would simply leave them there until the lions eventually kill him. Right? It's a, it's an execution. You know, you just leave him there until he's dead. Now, an ordeal is different. An ordeal was when an individual was subjected to deadly circumstances when suspected of a crime, such as being thrown into a river. If the person survived, they're innocent. If they die, they're guilty. All right, so some people say that's what's actually going on here. This is not an execution. This was an ordeal. Daniel's being put in there with the lions. If he's innocent, in the morning they'll come and find him, and uh, they'll bring him out. And so this was not technically an execution. But the problem here is that we already know Daniel is guilty of breaking Persian law because the text said so. It said, you know, you're not supposed to petition any god. You're supposed to petition the king. Well, he petitioned God. And so, you know, this, this whole idea that it's an ordeal uh, is wrong. It's actually an execution. Now, so what, if it's an execution, how come he didn't leave him down there when he found him? He was innocent. Well, perhaps the point is that divine authority found him innocent. And the king understood this. And so 
he lets Daniel out. All right, it's not a big deal. I think this is one of those places where interpreters make it more complicated than it needs to be. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Now, this is not going to be your favorite part of the story, where the children and the wives get their bones broken in pieces. How do we respond to this? While the punishment of a man's family for his crime is occasionally attested in biblical narratives, here is a list of places where stuff like that happens, it was not a part of ordinary ancient jurisprudence and was sometimes explicitly forbidden. Right? So this is not normative, but it does sometimes happen. That's the first thing we have to say. So why is it in here? Well, some people have tried to defend the narrator of the text, the writer, by saying, well, the writer isn't happy that the wives and the children were thrown to the lions. This is just part of a narrative thing. He's trying to show that, you know, the topos of a king's wrath. This is a, a topos that shows up a lot in ancient Jewish writings, how these kings are madmen and they're, the punishments they dish out always go too far. Well, I'm not just going to kill the guilty man. I'm going to kill his wife and his children. Right. Uh, uh, and, and so the narrator doesn't necessarily approve this. He's just telling you what happened. And a king may also want to do this because the children of the executed man might grow up with revenge in mind. And so you just wipe out the children to avoid a problem down the road. Now, I don't think that these are very convincing explanations. I think that Longman is right, and he's telling the truth when he says, the narrator seems to have taken some pleasure in the scene. That is the writer of this chapter. He likes this. He likes that these women and children were killed this way. And he says, we must remember, however, that this scene is presented to a generation of God's people who felt helpless in the grips of their oppressors. Their own families were impotent in the face of exploitation and worse. They were daily being manipulated for purposes other than their own. In other words, by time the Jews get to this point in exile, can you imagine how many people they have lost to violence? Can you imagine how often they have had their wealth plundered? How often they've been relocated? How often they've been cheated? How often members of their families had potentially been sexually exploited, right? If, if you remember all of that, then maybe you can give the writer a break when he writes this in his story. You don't have to agree with him. Right? You don't have to say that this is acceptable way to think for us as Christians. You, you don't have to say that just because this is written in the Bible. Uh, but at least understand, at least understand the writer. At least understand why he says the things that he says. Uh, you don't have to be totally at peace with the biblical text. I don't know why Christians think you have to be that way. Just understand the writer. Don't demonize the writer. Uh, just, just understand him. He's been through a lot. He has seen a lot. And so sometimes these things are going to show up. And if, you know, these things happen to you, uh, who knows, would you be any better? King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Now we're going to pay attention to what he says about the biblical God. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who saved Daniel from the power of the lion. Now, Longman, as well as others, have said, wait a minute, do we, do we have a problem here in the story? Because he's just said that you are to honor, to fear and tremble before the God of Israel. But he has already sent out a decree that cannot be revoked, that you're only to petition through the king. As Longman said, has the 30-day period of the first decree passed? If not, how could that unchangeable law be changed and replaced with this one? We cannot answer that question with certainly, certainty since we do not know the timing. However, what Longman seems to miss is that the king tells the people to tremble and fear before Daniel's God, not that they are free to petition him within the 30-day restriction. So I think Longman is, is seeing a problem here that doesn't exist. You, you just have to pay attention. 
uh, to the language. The signs and wonders language again calls, recalls Israel's deliverance from Egypt um, to survive exile uh, is similar in the biblical writers' minds oftentimes to surviving Egypt. The living God is significant coming from the mouth of this pagan king because uh, Jews oftentimes refer to Yahweh as the living God to contrast him with the dead idols of the nations. And obviously the eternal reign of God contrasts with the temporary reign of political powers like Persia. I want to end this by pointing out some typological connections between Daniel and Jesus. The Christian way to read the Old Testament, even though many modern critical thinkers will disagree with this, the way to read it is to see Jesus as the fulfillment of the institutions, persons, and prophecies throughout the Old Testament. And when you find striking connections with Jesus, uh, they are significant. Uh, here, we see that conspirators trap Darius using Persian law. They trap him into killing Daniel. But remember what the Pharisees say concerning Jesus to Pontius Pilate. If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out a king opposes Caesar. So in both stories, a political person is trapped into executing a righteous man. Darius is hesitant to have Daniel executed and works to prevent it. Pilate did the same thing. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, that is, to release Jesus. But like the king Darius, Pilate will fail. The king declared to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. Similar things are said to Jesus at the time of his execution. He trusts in God, let God deliver him, if he desires him, for he said, I am the son of God. The king went to his palace and sleep fled from him. This is interesting because something similar happens in the palace at the time of Jesus' execution. Pilate's wife says concerning Jesus, last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Daniel is shut in the pit with a stone that is sealed with the royal seal. Now this is interesting because what does it say in Matthew? And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of Jesus' tomb and went away. And they went and made the tomb secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. Striking similarity there. Now, the text tells us specifically that it's early in the morning that Daniel is found to be alive, and this looks like Christ as well. As it began to dawn on the first day of the week, the women went to the empty tomb. This was early in the morning. The king who discovers Daniel alive receives a blessing of life. O king, live forever. And he in turn declares God's eternal reign and saving power to the whole world through his declaration to the nations. The witnesses of the resurrection spent the rest of their lives rejoicing in eternal life and declaring the gospel of God's eternal reign and salvation. Uh, the only proper way to respond to an encounter with the raised and living Jesus Christ, uh, an event foreshadowed by the reaction of the king, when he finds the man alive early on the, in the morning who should have been dead, who was preserved miraculously by Yahweh's power, certainly a type and a foreshadowing of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. 